Okay, hello everybody and welcome um, to today's weekly low-carb lesson. Today we're going to be talking about what is the calcification score and what do we actually do with the results. I wanted to cover this topic because we're hearing a lot about calcium scores recently um, and knowing your score to determine your heart health. But what does it all mean and when you get the results, what do you do with it? You know, what do you decide what path to go down? So today we are very lucky enough to have Ivor Cummins to join us to explain it all. And I really want to thank you, Ivor, for taking the time to join us today. Um, so welcome, Ivor, to Ditch the Carbs. Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. Great to be here. <laughs> so, Ivor, why don't you tell everyone, I mean, everyone I think in the low-carb world knows who you are, but for people who are brand new, why not explain who you are, what you do, and how you almost became to be one of the top experts on cardiovascular health? Right, Libby. Well, it's probably a long story. I'll keep it short, though. So around seven years ago, I'm originally a biochemical engineer. I've spent around 30 years in corporate problem-solving leadership roles and basically leading teams across the world in complex problem-solving. So I know all the stats, I know all the technical, and I have a biochemical background. So in 2012, I got some pretty poor blood results. And I went to three doctors in succession because I was really kind of fixated on finding out what they were about. So I won't go into detail, but there was cholesterol, there was GGT, a liver enzyme, and there was serum ferritin, iron loading in the blood. And long story short, after several weeks and multiple doctors and not getting the answers I would expect from technical experts, <laughs> as it happened, uh, I went to PubMed and ResearchGate. I had corporate logons. And I basically researched these three blood markers and I discovered within a few weeks that the whole cholesterol story has been grossly exaggerated and I began to discover insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia, blood sugar. And I realized that I had a form of insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, and that was driving remorselessly my liver markers and other problem markers upwards. So in Nine weeks after I switched to a low-carb diet, uh, with some fasting I brought in because suddenly I could control my appetite and low-carb. That, <laughs> that was something I wasn't expecting. Um, I lost around 30 pounds, around 15 kilos in nine wow. weeks. And my retested bloods came in exactly as I expected. So all the metrics I got dramatically better. So I kind of knew I was correct in my research. And then I kept going um, for years and picked up more and more of a following from doctors, researchers, professors, lay people all over the world and began to go to a lot of conferences. Uh, I point out, though, I work for Irish Heart Disease Awareness, IHDA.ie, and David Bobbitt, the founder, has spent several million to get the news out on the calcium scan, which we'll talk about. Yeah. And that enabled me. So his um, sponsorship enabled me to go around the world and get the message out. So that's the only reason I'm able to do it. And isn't that wonderful that you've got somebody like that that can help get that message out there? And I think that's the... the it's almost like the guiding principle for so many of us who have gone low carb and have started either a website or a podcast or something. They're just dismayed at the current health system and they want, it comes from the heart that they want to do something to, to fix the problem themselves. You know, they're not waiting for it to come to us. We have to be part of the, the solution. And I think that's amazing what you've done. You, you had a problem, you didn't get the answers you want and you, man, you dug in deep to find out what, what the solution was. Well, yeah, basically the first few weeks I rapidly found out the overall challenge and then over the coming six months or so I went through more and more research and data. I probably have around 3,000 published scientific papers now on my hard drive of which half I've studied in a detailed way, the other half I've scanned to get the data, verify I'm correct. So there's a lot of research and work involved in, in pulling all of this complexity together in fairness. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably your engineering background, though, that's managed to pull it all together. <laughs> that, that's exactly it. It's brilliant. Hey, listen, before we start on the calcification, I just want to reiterate to everybody out there that we are not giving medical advice today. And if you need anything, you need to see your medical practitioner. Well, I always reiterate this, that you see most often. And we're just going to be covering tonight 
the um, calcium score and what is the current kind of um, suggestions around the, current, the calcium score and what to do with it. So we're not giving medical advice today. So I just want to reiterate that to everybody. So let's crack on to it and tell us what is calcium score? What is um, the coronary artery calcification as I understand it? And what is CAC scanning? What what is it and who should be having it? What age should people start be having it? All that kind of thing. I suppose it's a lot of questions all in one. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll give an overview. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty used to, uh, to running through this at this stage. So basically the heart uh, obviously beats and it's a fast moving object. And the calcium scan is a CT scan of the heart. And because the heart moves so fast for decades, they could only take x-rays, but it was blurred. So in the 70s and 80s, they developed a high-speed electron beam, a super-speed X-ray, and they could effectively freeze the heart by doing high-speed scans, like a strobe freezes a moving object. Mm -hmm. So long story short, they suddenly began to get clear images. And in those clear images, they were amazed to see that there was, in some people, calcium in the coronary arteries, clearly visible as white on the scan. And in other people, there was almost none and everything in between. So they also noticed early on that people who had high cholesterol or high blood pressure or things like that, you could have all these risk factors with no calcium or you could have no risk factors with huge amounts of disease and lots of calcium blocking up your, your arteries. So that's an important point to note that this scan sees the actual disease level Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't guess like looking at a bad blood marker and take a guess of whether you may or may it's not, not have it's heart not a theoretical risk of whether you or I have got high risk it's actual data and seeing what's actually happening inside it directly visualizes. yeah the calcium is a direct marker of atherosclerosis or the arterial disease that causes most heart attacks mm -hmm. so it's directly measuring and we say in engineering if you don't measure it it don't get fixed <laughs> <laughs> and basically, this is it. In an engineering world, if heart disease was an engineering problem, the scan would be used everywhere to mm. assure product quality and to fix the problem because it looks at the problem directly. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the power of it is you can have all kinds of soft plaque in your arteries that has not yet calcified because calcification is the natural progression of this disease. Mm -hmm. As these plaque in your arteries, like pustules, develop they begin to bring in calcium to stabilize them so it's an evolutionary response to injury uh, but the key thing is that the amount of soft plaque and dangerous plaque you have is directly correlated to the amount of calcium so someone with no calcium in the scan it basically means they have a very low level of any kind of plaque mm -hmm. right and someone with higher levels of calcium in the scan increasingly has more and more of the soft, dangerous plaque and calcified plaque, which shows in the scan. So some people say, oh, but the scan doesn't see the soft plaque, which might be dangerous. And they're missing the entire point. The calcium is the tip of the iceberg that betrays or shows the massive iceberg of soft plaque that's below the water. Right. So that it's an incredible risk marker because if you have a zero score, you might have a one to one and a half percent chance of a heart attack in the next 10 years for a middle-aged person. Mm -hmm. If you have a high score, you could have a 30 plus percent chance. So a high score versus a low one can be a 20 times multiplier of risk, whereas cholesterol or blood pressure might be a 1.5 times guess. Yeah, yeah. It's different. And then like you say, some people might actually have on paper all the risk factors and they're as clean as a whistle. Other people appear that they have no risk factors and then actually they could be shown and they've got calcification in their arteries. Exactly, Libby. And um, David Bobbitt, my sponsor, who set up IHDA.ie, he's the perfect example. The reason he's gone on this mission and spent so much money is because he got a random scan by coincidence he had been acing his treadmills, ECGs, executive medicals. He was slim, running four times a week, and his bloods looked okay. And then he got a 906 score, Ooh. and they told him, you've got three blocked arteries, you have a massive level of disease. So he realized this should be used all over the world, and it will find people like me, countless yeah. millions, 
and allow us to intervene and save them. You know, yeah. with medications as appropriate or certainly by fixing the problems that are driving the disease. But you have to know that it's there in the first place, which I guess is what the, the, the calcium scanning is doing, isn't it? And I remember watching the Widowmaker movie that, um, you know, it's all about the, you know, calcium scanning. And I remember watching there that Clinton was scanned and he suddenly was discovered to have an extensive, you know, heart disease problems. Yet he'd been through three um, running machines. He'd, he'd passed all of his tests. So he passed absolutely everything that in theory should have shown that he had his heart was as clean as a whistle, but actually it was the opposite yeah those countless millions of people like clinton or david bobbish these are just examples but mm -hmm. countless millions out there fit that description yeah. and ironically yeah people who are who are actually very exercised like david sometimes they can actually hide their risk markers so if you have someone who's sitting on the sofa and watching television and eating pizza and drinking soft drinks <laughs> doing no exercise generally those people who are who are doing really bad things their blood markers will generally show what's going on mm. but often ironically the people who are doing a lot of exercise they're still eating high carbon sugar because they don't realize that's the big problem but the exercise can make their bloods appear more okay. Right. Uh, so the, the calcium scan is crucial for those people. And TOFIs, thin outside, fat inside people, who are not very obese or overweight, who are not smokers, and the doc thinks they're probably fine, their cholesterol looks fine, right? Or yeah. sorry, I should say, the people who are overweight and smoking, the doc will tell them you, you've probably got a problem. So they'll yeah. get a lot of attention. But the tofies who are slim appearing, but they have fat in their organs and they're insulin mm -hmm. resistant, yep. those guys really think they're okay, but they can have enormous disease on the scan. Exactly. So who would you, or who is suggested should be having them? Is it those people that sort of like the middle ground, not the, the ones that in, in appear to be very, very low risk and not the ones, I guess, that are being high, high risk? Is it the people in the middle who should be having them? At what age should you be having them? Yeah, great questions, Libby. So it is the middle risk people. So for people to understand, if you're very low risk in the blood markers, multiple markers, they're all good, and your algorithm risk score from the world's algorithms is below 5% in the next 10 years, risk of a heart attack, you're very low risk. You're unlikely to have a very high calcium result. You could, but you're you're less likely, so they don't really recommend for those people. Most of them are probably okay. The very high risk of both 20% who have loads of bad blood markers, those people, to be honest, almost certainly have a problem. They don't really need a scan to tell you know, them. No, you already know that they're really high risk, yeah, yeah. Very high risk, in fairness, most of those people will genuinely be at high risk, so they don't need the scan as much. But the fuzzy middle, the majority of people now are middle risk. That's the majority of people, mm. five to 20%. And those people, if you scan them, studies show that up to 70% of those people can be moved into high risk or low risk based on the five minute scan. Wow. So all of, all, yeah, it's, it's huge. All of these fuzzy middle, where we don't really know what they are, they're middle and risk. All the kind of guesswork out of it, I guess it's just taken out of it. You know exactly whether to sort of escalate treatment or, you know, de-prescribe or, or dial it back. But those people who do know now what they need to do. Precisely, Libby. Mm. That's exactly it. That's the power of measuring it right. Mm. And so what, how is a calcium scanner or the CAC scan, how is it different to what's currently available? Well, what's currently available is hugely variable, to be quite honest. So you can get a carotid, a CIMT, Mm -hmm. uh, an ultrasound scan of your carotid artery, and it's a relatively poor risk predictor. But it can be good to track people once they've got a calcium scan, they know they have disease, they can use the CIMT to track their progress, like which direction are they going. It can mm -hmm. be good for that, but it's not much good for risk es estimation because it, it's vastly lower in power than the calcium scan. Mm -hmm. And we've got all the blood risk factors, you know, that are all put into the algorithm, like framing them. And they give an idea, like we said, of low, medium, or high risk. And on the other end then, so they're the basic screening things, but they're guesswork. So yeah. you need the scan. But on the other end then, ironically, 
the business of medicine sometimes pushes towards, if you ask for a calcium scan that's quick and non-invasive, they push towards, well, let's do a CT angio and inject dye into you and then do the CT and we get better images. So then that's going too far for an asymptomatic middle risk person. Mm. It's going much too far or getting an angiogram and actually looking inside with cameras. Yeah. So you, we really need to find the middle for asymptomatic middle risk people. The CAC scan blows everything else away. And if you're symptomatic and you have chest pain and, and clearly are in a dangerous potential situation, Mm. They might go towards going straight to a CT angio or an angiogram because you're a symptomatic person. You're now in a different class. Mm -hmm. But for asymptomatic, no symptoms, which is the vast majority, middle risk, the CAC scan, bang, you find out your level of disease. Yeah, yeah. So why don't doctors know about it more? Or why don't they offer it more? Because I know, obviously, that um, I've also discovered that it's always offered to astronauts and presidents because that's their highest risk factor, isn't it? Because they're middle-aged men generally who are astronauts and the presidents. So obviously they want to know not even the risk factor, but the actual, you know, what is actually going on. Why aren't GPs and maybe a lot of the doctors out there, why are they unaware or why are they not giving it as often as maybe it should be suggested that it's given? Yeah, well, that's a kind of a long story, but I'll, I'll do the brief bullets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, you maybe can link afterwards to the Widowmaker movie. Cause yes, yes honest, I'd love to do that. Yeah, the Widowmaker movie, and there's a free version there that David actually sponsored to be made to mm -hmm. tell people about the scan. That goes through all the history and the dramatic uh, intrigue and financial things that drove the scan being pushed downwards. Yeah. and. It tells the full story. But really simply, cardiology, when the scan came out 30 or 40 years ago, began to hate it very quickly. And there's a few key reasons. One, it was being offered direct to the public. And cardiology is a very ivory tower type business. <laughs> and direct to yeah. the person giving them the power to just get a scan, find out their disease, and then ask, why have I got this disease? They didn't like that. They hated that. The other big thing was they did a study in the Mayo Clinic in the cardiology department, and they found out if we scan all of the people who are going to go in for the invasive testing, like the CT and the angiogram, yeah. if we scan them all, we actually know from the data now that 50% of them have zero scores, and there's no way they should need to go in for an angiogram because there's risk in that, and it's highly expensive. So the Mayo Clinic management shut the project down because they realized the cat lab that does the invasive procedures is 30% of our overall revenue, and that would be halved. No way. It's and outrageous. Just, it, it's outrageous when you hear of all these things, isn't it? That, you know, do people really just check their morals in at the door as they start their day? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it, <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds really bad to lay people, but if you have a lot of corporate experience and I do, these mm. decisions get made and, and the business does come first. Yeah. And to be honest, I guess they were thinking as well, they're not making a decision directly to kill people. No way. They're just making a decision to double their number of procedures, which are expensive and wasteful in half the cases, but they're not killing people. Now, what they didn't realize with that was by pushing the scan down and not liking it, they denied millions of people the chance to save their own lives. So indirectly, yes really bad and that's the sad thing isn't it that how many lives could have been saved if people had known their risk and known what either um aggressive treatment to either then take or uh, you know different lifestyle changes to take um and also conversely how many people unnecessarily gone through the procedures or medication that then had their own that's another whole you know aspect of it that they didn't need to be on or didn't need to go through well, yeah, I, and just before I get into that, one last big reason was the inventors of the scan who I interviewed, they went to the pharmaceutical companies, I think five or six of the big ones, and those guys looked at the data and realized this scan will take more people off drugs who don't currently need them than it will put people on. So they said, no, thank you. So there was also a lot of animosity there. They didn't want this scan for obvious reasons. Yeah. And the last one is cholesterol. 
We know now that cholesterol is a very weak risk factor. It's not irrelevant, but it's very weak compared to the real ones. And scanning studies showed that cholesterol doesn't even correlate to the level of arterial disease from the calcium scan. So that's another reason that it would be very embarrassing if everyone was getting scans and we were getting myriad people turning up with zero scores when they have huge cholesterol and with very high scores when they have normal or low cholesterol. So that's another awkward thing, I think, that worked against the scan. Exactly, exactly, because we're testing one thing, but we're telling you to do something else, which actually has nothing to do with actually what's being caused. So, okay, so we've talked about the what is the scanning and who should be, it's not the high risk or the low risk, it's that kind of grey area where you need to really determine where you are. So if you've gone in for a scan and you come out with your numbers and you can talk maybe about what the different risk factors are, so the risk, um, the different categories that you come out, and then what do you do with that score? What do you know whether to either de-prescribe if you need to or actually go into a something more aggressive right okay well if people go to ihda.ie homepage mm -hmm. the great thing is a lot of this gets explained as well Excellent. and all the numbers and everything yep. and the new guidelines are strongly endorsing cac but i give a basic overview mm -hmm. so middle-aged middle risk people men over 40 or 45, women over 50 or 55, because women develop less heart disease pre-menopause, so that's why the ages are different. So they're the group. Uh, the scores, if you're a score of zero, you are very low risk, which is great. If you're a score of one to 100, you know you're a moderate risk. If you're 100 to 400, you're kind of high risk, and over 400 is really high risk. But I have people, a 29-year-old with a 600 score with the arteries of an 80-something-year-old. And I've got a 72-year-old with a zero. He's the oldest zero. So I want to see what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. And, well, th this is it. If you know your score, you can begin to change your life to stop mm. it progressing. But mm. anyway, the low, the low scores or zero is maybe 1.5% risk in the next 10 years of a heart event. And to be honest, a lot of those heart events will be electrical problems or things that are not to do with the arterial disease of atherosclerosis. So okay. a zero is amazing in general. Yeah. But then if you get over a thousand, you can be looking more like a 30% chance, which is maybe 20 times higher. So the risk stratification is enormous. And then when you get into what do you do, what's the point in getting a 900 like David did but not being able to do anything. Well, the first thing you can do, in fairness, is you can get medications appropriate for that level of disease. So medications do stabilize the plaque. They don't really work so much with the cholesterol. They have a lot of other uh, mechanisms, but they stabilize plaque and lower events. So the very least people can do is some medication to stabilize their extensive disease. Mm -hmm. And if you're over 100 now score, the new guidelines 2018 have pretty much said if you're over 100 score, you know, medications are indicated. And if you're below 100, and other studies have shown this too late last year, a statin may give you no benefit over 12 years whatsoever. Over so 12 really, years, wow. Yeah, there's one study out and I spoke to the author and I got all the extra supplemental data, very interesting. And what they saw is a large group of people Statin, no statin, but when their score was below 100, they saw no benefit effectively over 12 years of tracking. But in the people over 100 and over 400, the statin showed a very substantial lowering of events because mm -hmm. the drug works well with people who have extensive progressive disease. It can act and, and help. But if you have minimal disease, the drug can't help much, and then you're left with just the side effects, which doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So what would be your top tips then for somebody to maybe make, say, instead of, you know, if the statins are not appropriate for them and they don't want to go on anything, and like you said, it's only appropriate for certain categories, what would other lifestyle um, modifications that they could do to get that those clean whistles of that 70-year-old who's got a zero score? What's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, that individual, he actually didn't have a, an amazingly great diet, but a mixture of genetics and a lot of exercise and a pretty good diet, I think, came together. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so the things you would do, if we think of uh, medications are a mitigator, 
they can mitigate your problem, but they don't fix the cause. Yeah. So the big thing that people should do is attempt to fix the cause. And there are many causes. The biggest cause bar none, overwhelmingly for arterial disease, what we're talking about is diabetes. Now, you might think that 10% of people are diabetic nowadays. It's an epidemic. The reality is, though, that in America, where I have the figures, 65% of over 45-year-old adults in America, across America, are now pre-diabetic or diabetic from 65%, CDC. 65 so around the world, it ain't going to be much different. And if you used insulin measurements, you'd find out probably 75 plus percent are essentially diabetic or of some level of diabetes. So of obviously the biggest root cause you're going to find out there for this, and in David's case, he found out he was an undiagnosed diabetic. You're going to find out you're insulin resistant. You have diabetic physiology. All right? You might not be diagnosed. So fixing that is no brainer for a disease of carbohydrate intolerance, which is what type two diabetes is. Yep. You go on a much lower carb diet, low glycemic, low carb, you can still eat vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, all that stuff, but take away all the fast absorbing sugars because you can't handle them. Yeah. And then you eat meat, fish, eggs, olives, you know, you can use coconut oil, you can use beef tallows, it does cheeses, if you're not sensitive to them. And there's a whole load of real foods, ancestral foods you can eat, mm. and all the above ground vegetables, which you take away all the breads, pastas, rices, everything that's gonna explode up your blood glucose and your blood insulin, because that's what's rotting your arteries. So that's the big cause and, and what you do. Mm -hmm. But there are other causes Insulin resistance can be driven by lack of sleep, lack of sun exposure. Stress can drive up your insulin. So it's not just diet. There's quite a few environmental factors you want to fix. Mm. And then there's other things. Magnesium deficiency is a huge issue. So getting magnesium in your foods or a few hundred milligrams a day of magnesium is really important. And vitamin K2 from natural ancestral foods like cheeses and natto in Japan, or you can take a supplement. So yeah. having a low K2, there's a lot of evidence building to say it can leave you very exposed to arterial disease. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a magic vitamin, but you could be very exposed by being low. Mm -hmm. And selenium, chromium, chromium, there's a few other critical elements that in the last 50 or 60 years, the food is depleted in them. And even yeah. the soils. That's right, so, a lot of the soils are, aren't they? Yeah, I just got a tweet from a friend of mine, Brendan, today, who's involved in agriculture. And he sent me a tweet, and I forget the figures, I only glanced, but it's US uh, data from the US government that I think the nutrients in our vegetables, fruit, and generally have gone down something like 60% in the last few decades. So, they're essentially admitting that you need to eat two or two and a half times as much of things to get the same nutrients as we got 50 years ago. So this is a big problem. And, and those were official, and maybe CDC or maybe U.S. Department of Agriculture, but they're official figures. I'll send the link on after. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be great. And I can include it. So, so we've gone through, so, you know, like you say, it, the type two diabetes and, and di type one, but diabetes and the intolerance to carbohydrates and living on this chronic high blood sugar level um, and your hyperinsulinemia. And I've talked about that in previous lessons that people can go and watch. That's one of, like you say, it's the biggest, biggest risk factor that we can actually address, you know, and that causes inflammation. And that's what they say now if, in, correct me, but, you know, is, um, you know, inflammation is the real killer and your, basically your cholesterol, your plaques are coming along to kind of soothe that inflammation that's in there. Essentially, that's a way of looking at it. Another way of looking at cholesterol, essentially atherosclerosis, one of the most important initiating events is the endothelium, the lining of your artery. That's a very thin lining. When it becomes disrupted or inflamed or damaged in any way, high blood sugar and high insulin is a classic example, but smoking and many other things can do it. When that lining becomes damaged, you can begin to have a problem with cholesterol particles in your blood getting engaged. But the reality is the best way to look at cholesterol is you have trillions and trillions of little cholesterol lipoproteins, the LDLs, 
and think of them as getting damaged by blood sugar, damaged by autoimmune conditions, damaged by bad foods and leaky gut. Think of all your LDL particles as getting damaged and then becoming part of the problem. That's the best way to think of it. Mm -hmm. Rather than thinking evolution designed LDL just to give us heart disease, it's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> it's obviously absurd. Exactly. And so damage is the key yeah, uh, yeah. to LDL. Okay. We don't want to go into statins too much here, but can you explain, Is there, what does the research suggest that who statins, who benefits the most from statins? You know, the men versus women things, because most of the studies are done on overweight, middle-aged men or high risk and not on women. Say if somebody went and got a, a calcium scan, maybe they needed to go on a statin. Who really does benefit the most? Right. Well, yeah, statins, you know, it's a very controversial area. And, and you're right, I don't get into it too much. But myself, David, the IHDA, it seems very clear to us, and it largely is an agreement with, with the guidelines, that people who have had a prior heart attack, which means they obviously have very high disease, like we yeah, said yeah. earlier, people who have a high calcium score, which they might as well have had a heart attack if they have a high score, because it's a risk equivalent. Of, of having had a heart attack. Uh, so, and very high risk people from the genuine risk algorithms, like people with high LDL, low HDL, and high triglycerides, which we call the triad. And that'll come up in the risk algorithms along with blood pressure or diabetes history. And it really will call you high risk. Yep. And those people are very high risk. If they are genuinely high risk, are very likely to benefit. Mm. So there's kind of a set of people. The calcium score is fantastic and the new guidelines in that study I mentioned, because yep. that's really making it clean. If you're over 100 with, with big disease, you're kind of in the camp of benefiting. You're below 100, it's between you and your doctor. Do you want to take this potentially advantageous thing, with maybe with side effects, or do you want to fix the root causes, which yeah, will probably yeah. be vastly more important for the majority of people to do and you will only know that if you know your calcium score isn't yeah, it or if, yeah. if you've already had a heart attack you'll you'll know as well yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> that's a big way of finding out but unfortunately 40 percent of people die with their first heart attack and yeah. that's why this discussion is so important and there was one other thing on the statins i think let me think now on medications in general no oh, it slipped my mind It'll come yeah, to you. Yeah. Tell me, and I'll put it in the link below when I when I write when I write this all up. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. What would be like? We've we've discussed all of those. What would be your three almost top takeaways? Somebody who's coming in here and watching this, they're worried about you know all of the heart heart um, health risks. What would be your three top takeaways from all of this? From all of this, I'd say first and foremost, if you're middle risk, middle aged. 45 or over for men, 55 or over for women, mm -hmm. you're in the bracket now where calcium scan is recommended to find out your real level of risk and mm -hmm. enable you to take action. So that's the key thing. The second thing is, I would say, fixing the root causes. We talked about medications and they have something to offer, but fixing the root causes with what I listed a few minutes ago. Yep. Primary thing is get low insulin, low glucose, uh, low HOMA IR, which is an insulin resistance measure, get yourself from the diabetic end of the spectrum right down to the least diabetic, non-diabetic. And then there's nutrients, vitamins, minerals, exercise, sleep, and a lot of things. And it's all in our book, Eat Rich, Live Long. But there's a whole load of things you can do. And with a high score, it behooves you to do all of them, not just do one thing, like I'm going to yeah. do a bit of exercise. You know, yeah. it's your life. It's your opportunity to save your own life. Absolutely. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the third thing is progression. So people often ask about progression of calcium scores and disease. And the beauty is we now know from many studies that if you can stop your progression of calcium through whatever means, mm -hmm. your risk will plummet. So if you get someone with a 900 score, they obviously have a huge risk on that day they have big disease, mm -hmm. but if they fix the causes and maybe have some meds and a year later, they've only gone up five or 6%. So let's say they've gone up to, I don't know, 950 or 940. That's amazing. 
So that's low progression or okay. stopping progression can happen and even reversing. But a person who has a five to 15% increase per year, per year, mm -hmm. that's low progression and they are nearly as safe as someone with a low score. Ah. The tragedy, yeah, the tragedy is the vast people, majority of people don't know what their score is and the vast majority go 25 or 30% a year straight up to their heart attack down the road. Uh. But what needs to get out around the world is if you fix the causes the calcification will slow down, the arteries will cool and become less inflamed, and the risk goes over a cliff edge and goes down because the arteries now are less likely to rupture and yeah, to yeah. burst. Oh, that's brilliant. Honestly, you've, you've, you've absolutely covered everything. I think people are going to get a real, um, be really well informed watching this because people, you know, it's not explained in the way that you just have done in a very um, easy to understand manner. So it's absolutely wonderful. Now I've got three questions for you from some of my um, members in my membership. They always know they get to ask my guest expert three questions. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you some of those. One of them has said, now what level of total cholesterol in LDL would you expect somebody to begin having a CAC scan or a particle size count? Now, this particular, if, you know, like I say, we're not giving medical advice, but also a lot of people in my um, membership, they're all losing weight. So, of course, I know your LDL can temporarily rise when, you know, losing weight. But what level of total um, cholesterol and LDL would you expect to start having that done? Okay, well, I'd say the critical thing to know is that you shouldn't be looking at LDL really in isolation and this is known for decades so the head of Framingham a cardiology guy um, Italian name escapes me now published a paper in 1991 mm -hmm. and he said unless LDL is above 7.8 millimoles now that's around 300 milligrams in American units LDL alone unless it's above that it is no real utility on its own to predict heart attacks. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing. LDL is a marker. If it shoots up, you, you gotta be careful to look at all the other markers, but on its own, it's not much use. It's more used as a treatment target for people on drugs to see mm -hmm. how they're responding. People should be using the algorithms. So mm -hmm. one of them is if you Google MESA, MESA calculator, Mm -hmm. You will find the MESA calculator and put in your total, your HDL, your diabetes, your blood pressure. That's the way to check your risk, not thinking about just single LDL. And what you'll find there is for people with no diabetes, no hypertension, no family history, and they're in great shape for all those things, they can have a total of eight millimole and an LDL around five and they're still coming out as low risk. They're not even in middle risk. So remember, use the algorithms like MISA. That's the way to get your risk, not individual numbers. And doctors need to grasp this around the world. They need to realize they should be using the algorithm and not individual figures. The other thing is the advanced lipoproteins. You mentioned LDL particle count. Mm -hmm. They're not so available. But it's generally seen that the LDLP, if it's above 15 or 1600, that's kind of in higher risk. But unfortunately, again, it's a single measure. You've got to be really careful. Mm -hmm. It's much better to get the APOB over APOA1 ratio, just like right. the algorithms. And that APOB is kind of LDLP, slightly different measure. But the ApoB over ApoA1 takes account of everything like the algorithms do. Whereas mm -hmm. ApoB in its own could be high, but you could actually be super healthy. Or it could jump up and be high because you've got a problem. But you don't really know unless you use more measures. And that's the thing is that you don't, nobody wants to go on sort of lifelong medication from just one isolated blood test. It should be a whole range of blood tests. And like you say, it's HbA1c, it's your triglycerides, it's your um, fasting blood glucose, it's your HbA, it's all of these things. And also seeing the trends of them. You know, it could be that on that particular day, because they're, they're quite... Um, um, reactive some of these things that on one day it might be something and one day it might be something else so it's not just just looking at one thing in particular 
Yeah, exactly. And it just occurred to me there, Libby, a friend of mine, Dr. Ted Naiman, many might know him. Yes. Uh, he was telling me that, uh, I think it was in Seattle, we were having a chat in the lobby with a load of people around and talking about this. And he was saying he has people who come in who've been on the statin fairly high strength for 25 years, a quarter century, based on a single cholesterol measurement at the start. And they were high in cholesterol back then, just LDL or even total, which they don't use anymore. <laughs> and you go on the statin and there's no reason to come off it. So imagine the millions of people who just went on. Nowadays, they're meant to use the algorithm, so it's not so bad. I think a lot of doctors are still seeing a high LDL yeah, and yeah. reaching for the pad. But 20 years ago, everyone was getting statins based on just their total or their LDL. Yeah. So there's millions of those people out there. <laughs> God. Okay, I've got another question for you. How often should you have a CAT scan if you find out your score is high once a year as a long, scary wait? Does that yes. also go to the point of, you know, how people are scared that they've got this ticking time bomb and it's almost like it can go off just like that, but actually we just kind of need to relax and work with the process and work on reversing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if someone, I guess there are people, if they can't handle finding out, you could argue maybe they shouldn't find out, but that has to be a small number of people because most people want to know their level of disease and want to take action and make it their own project. So the thing about a high score is I would not panic. I got a zero at, at 48 years of age as it happens, but to be, I would not panic anymore given what I know. Mm -hmm. If you have a high score and you take all the right actions and the, the data is out there on the root cause now, root causes and those medications, you can stop your progression. So if someone got a high score, like say up at 900, like David, then maybe 18 months later, after you've taken lots of actions, you'll go back and check because you're a high scoring person and a year and a half, two years is probably the right gap to give you time to do all your work. Uh, but if you're a low scoring person, it might be more like eight or nine years. I'd probably wait eight or nine years. Because oh, wow. Most, yeah, okay. Yeah. And this, this is a great question because a very low score or a zero, it's not that you have zero disease, you just have very low plaque burden, very low risk. And it doesn't make sense getting a scan once you've got a zero or a very low score for quite a while. Um, so engineering wise, it makes sense, you know, high score, you'll want to come back in 18 months or 24 months to verify that your actions are working, that you're not rising too fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's fair. Okay. And my third and final question for them is what CAC score would you suggest a statin might be required? I know you've kind of touched on that, but... Well, yeah, it would have been a hard question to answer, but this a study that came out late last year, very well executed. It was associational, but it was very well modeled and, and their treatment and stats. It would appear that over 100 is a broad guideline where your level of disease is high enough that you're likely in the benefit group. Mm -hmm. And if you're below 100 from this published paper and, and the AHA and ACC in the US are largely going in this direction, it's a conversation with you and your doctor. If you're paranoid and you have a low level of disease, but you really want every single thing that could avoid a problem, you might decide, I want that too. Or you can decide, well, I have a low level of disease. The study now says I probably won't benefit much from this. I'm going to fix the root causes mm -hmm. and I'm going to improve my health and not need it. But that's between you and your doctor. That's a, a decision. And I think you've made a good point is you've got to decide what's right in your position. You know, some people, like you say, some people may get actually the benefits outweigh the risk of either being on it or not being on it, whichever way it is round for you and what you want to avoid, whether you want to avoid the side effects or whether you want to avoid, you know, the potential risk of not going on anything. It's absolutely a choice that you need to make with your doctor rather than it being literally the choices prescribed to you. I know the drug is going to be, but the actual choice, sometimes so many people feel that that's what their doctor is doing is they're not part of the conversation. You know, I have so many people in the group who say, my doctor is really wanting me to do this or really do want to do that. And I said, really, it's a joint decision for anything in healthcare. You've got to be your own advocate because no one else is going to be, you know, yeah, that's a really important point. I and mean, sometimes we just take for granted, you just take what a person tells you and, mm -hmm. and do it. 
But that's actually kind of crazy when you think about it. We are the authors of our own destiny. Mm. And just by getting some knowledge and all the published research is out there, you can look, you can look at the NNT, the number needed to treat. And that's the number of people who take a drug for one to benefit in the next 10 years. And what's and that for the statins? Isn't it somebody so many hundred over so many years to cause, I think, three days saved of life or something? Yeah, that paper in the British Medical Journal suggested that although events are lowered, uh, that you only extend your life by a few days on average. Uh, I'm not so sure of the stats in that. You know, it's a little ropey, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I give a good example, though, the number needed to, to treat. We have papers going way back in studies that if you have a high CAC score and lots of disease, the number needed to treat might be like one in 20. Yeah. So in other words, for 20 people on statins for the next 10 years, one will get an appreciable benefit. It doesn't sound amazing, but, but you know, a, a lot of people would take that. But with a low calcium score, just like the other study from last year, with a low calcium score, it might be 120. Yeah. So 120 people take this drug for 10 years for one person to get a benefit. Yeah. And that's something that people might say, well, hold on a minute. So you're, you talk to your doctor about the NNT and say, and many doctors, I think this is an important point to say, and I don't think it's unfair because I know many, many doctors and a lot who have converted to my viewpoint over the last few years. And they perceived the statin as kind of almost magical mm -hmm. that, you know, anyone with heart risk, you give a statin and, and you know, you're, you're in great shape. You're going to drastically reduce your risk and you're going to put off that heart attack for a long, long time. Yeah. It was just perceived as you take it, you're fine, largely. But we know from the conversation in NNT, we've just had, well, no, that's not true. And there's no conspiracy. It's just no one really focuses on the NNT. They, they like to believe it's just you take a statin and you're sorted out. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's also important to point out that a lot of doctors out there, I've, I think some people think sometimes that we're kind of getting at them, that maybe, you know, that they're sort of... Um, you know, they're maybe not as up to date or whatever, but I think it's it's also a two way street. Yes, we want to be our own sort of, you know, like I say, their own sort of masters of our destiny. We we're our own our own health advocate, but also it's a really good opportunity for us to discuss what we understand with our GP. You know, I've had a number of members who have come through and they've said, "Oh, I've discussed with my GP, and they can't believe the results I've had. They can't believe." what phenomenal health improvements I've had. And it's like, no, you know, no GP goes to work to sort of, you know, try and be out of date or maybe learn things. And the number of, I just think the number of medical professionals who have learned so much from their patients being open, it's a two way thing. It really, really is. A lot of pa doctors are learning from their patients. Uh, absolutely. And especially in the internet age, Libby, uh, because without the internet and the availability of those thousands of research papers, or even for anyone to find any videos like this explaining things. Without that, we'd all be in the dark ages still. But exactly. I agree totally. And so many are converting. There's no question. Uh, there's one doctor, and ah, I shouldn't say this. It's not boastful, but a tweet the other day, to your point. And yeah. if you want to do this as the intro to this video, if you do a little intro clip, this is it. So a uh, Dr. Bagshaw in the UK is 40 years a MD a GP, a general practitioner, yep. huge experience. And my talk in uh, Denver in March went out on video with Low Carb Down Under the other day, very popular. And he went on Twitter, I don't even know him. And he said, I've learned more in 20 minutes from Ivor in this talk than I have in 40 years of practicing medicine uh, on the root causes of modern disease. I've and, you seen know, that tweet somehow. I've, I've somehow seen that tweet. <laughs> But, but it just goes to show, and I have so many medical professionals in Ireland now and around the world who five years ago were skeptical but wanted to, to talk, and now they're completely converted. And the reason they're converted is because when you go through the data properly and explain it, a lot of this becomes very clear. Mm. And really. isn't it wonderful that they're open to, to understanding? I mean, there's some that aren't. Um, but I think it's wonderful that they're open to that complete kind of reversal of and just updating themselves. I think it's brilliant. So you're doing a fabulous job, Ivor. You really, really are. All right. Thanks, Libby. And I always, I must say as well, you know, David Bobbitt by sponsoring me and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness 
without that, I mean, years ago, I'd probably have to just go back to my corporate day job and I couldn't do any of this. So Absolutely. And thank you to him because, like you say, I wonder how many lives he will be saving because if this gets out to how many hundreds or thousands of people and they go and have a calcium scan, they know their score, they then know what to do. Um, it's, it's, he, really, he really could be saving some lives out there today, really could. So thank you. Yeah, and that's just in this talk, but over the years, yeah, it's, the message is getting far and wide. And thanks, Libby, for helping getting it out there. Again, we have no profit. It's all spent. He spent millions of dollars. There's zero return. Non-profit, it's simply to save people's lives. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ivor, and I'll put all the links below where everyone can follow you and um, follow the um, IDHE and everywhere that they can contact you as well. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Libby. Have a great day or evening. Yes. <laughs>